This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to what is already an astonishingly interesting afternoon. Um, I'm sorry, you're squinting into the sun, but I can't reach the curtains. <laughs> but it was forecast for rain, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> right, faces are special. They play a special role in our personal identity. We've already talked about that. They play a special role in institutional and national identity. Nations have portrait galleries. They show their faces there. And the perception of different signals from faces relies on dedicated neural machinery, so they're special to the brain as well. Now, we've already talked a little bit about Richard Gregory today, so I thought it would be nice to show him, reminding us of how special faces are. Does this all work? This is the hollow head. Actually, at the moment, it's a perfectly normal head of Charlie Chaplin. But wait, as it comes round, you'll see, or will you, that it's hollow. The back of it coming round now is actually... Richard! <laughs> you see, I was worried about copyright. <laughs> well, you can see it. You don't need any more sound for the rest of this talk. And you've heard him. Do you need the sound? We don't need the sound. Somebody else might need the sound. You've heard Richard describing one of many versions of the hollow face of the illusion. Why am I showing this? First, because Richard Gregory. Um, a dear friend, sadly departed, said more and more eloquently about the role of expectations and prior and established knowledge on perception than many other people. Secondly, because this demonstration and many other variants of it show that faces are so special, so important, so privileged for us, that you cannot see that mask accurately. You cannot do anything but see it as a face, even though that completely screws up the rest of the perception of that display. That's why I'm showing you that. Right. So, I'm sorry that we... But he's done his bit as far as this talk goes. So Richard Gregory's is one of a number of striking illustrations of the powerful effects of the face schema on perception. And there are striking effects of the face schema on behaviour as well. Lovely experiment by some of my colleagues at Newcastle University, and they've done various variants of this since. What they did was they exploited the fact that in the Institute of Neuroscience in Newcastle, there's a coffee that you help yourself to, there's an honesty box you're supposed to chip money into. And um, they used measures of milk consumption um, and against money to measure how honest people were week on week. And some weeks they put above the honesty box with the reminder to pay eyes, and other weeks they just put pictures of flowers. And they found that people put more money in the honesty box the weeks that they were being observed. And they've done various replications of this since. Uh, and in fact, we have the um, eyes beside the bike racks in Newcastle, and where the eyes are beside the bike racks, people don't steal the bikes so much, it, they go and steal them from other racks where the market is. It's the same with CCTV cameras. You don't change crime, you just move it around. But where you're being observed, uh, you, you, you make a difference. So, so that was uh, quite a nice effect of eyes on behaviour. Um, something perhaps Kitchener knew about many a long, long time ago. Um, courtesy of Mark Johnson and, and many others. Newborn babies minutes old will follow faces and face-like patterns further with their eyes and heads than other control patterns. They come into the world ready to grab faces 
just as a little newly hatched duckling comes into the world ready to follow something that looks a little bit like something from its own species, so more than other face-like things. And perhaps more surprisingly, babies show some recognition of their own mum's face within just 48 hours of birth. So you come into the world ready to look at faces, and you learn about faces very, very quickly after that uh, initial uh, kick start. So faces are special. Face, the face schema is special for us. We're ready to see things that look like the face schema at birth. And distortions of the face schema can be quite hard to look at. Um, something that we used to play around in my lab years ago was, you know, you sort of can't look at that. You simply can't process something that looks like that. And I'm sure there's some interesting science you could do with that, but I never ever have done any interesting science with it. Um, we mostly naturally tend to look at faces when they're present in scenes. Uh, these are some rather nice um, visual looking hot spots. Uh, it, where it's red, people are looking most and longest. Uh, and where it's uh, green and orange, they're looking a little bit. And where it's grey, they're not looking at all. This is from my uh, current co uh, colleague Debbie Ryby and Peter Hancock from Sterling. Uh, this is the average hotspot coming out of a group of typically developing children looking at this interesting wedding scene. And uh, what you see is they look at faces. Uh, they also, oh, sorry, interestingly, look at the cleavage on the br and the bride. So they're looking a bit there as well. That's an interesting bit of body. But that's what they're looking at. This is a uh, uh, similar hotspot from uh, autistic children. And they are not looking at the faces. They are looking at things other than faces. And this is from a uh, Williams syndrome group, which is a, a, a rare and interesting but different disorder of development. Uh, and they are looking at faces and nothing but faces. And interestingly, the only other thing that you can pick up, I can't see me, cursor, if you look at the far left here, the other thing that you might be able to see that they're looking at there is a tiny little face. It's a tiny little face over there, and that's grabbed the attention as well. So, you know, faces are really important things for us. Why are they so impo important? Well, they're immensely informative. Momentary changes in faces support the interpretation of emotions. Understanding speech, we all lip read, not just people who are hard of hearing. Understanding other people's focus of attention. But structural differences between one face and another tell us about whether, whether we like the look of that face, whether they're attractive or not. Something about the social group that somebody belongs to, male, female, this sort of age, that sort of age, racial group. And if you know them, their identity. So you're getting an awful lot of different kinds of important social information from faces. And yet, they've all got to be exactly the same. Every human face has to be exactly the same because the demands of vision, audition, breathing, eating, spe speaking force a common pattern. So the particular characteristics of human faces, different from dog faces or horse faces or other sorts of faces, are given us as a result of evolution to do all the clever things that our sensory organs on our faces do in exactly the way that they do. So our eyes are all the same distance apart so we can do stereo vision. Our noses and mouths are all arranged in this sort of order so we don't choke. Um, our lips and tongues and jaws are created in order to allow us to speak as well as to eat and do other things. So all faces are identical and yet we read all these messages. Isn't that interesting? Very, very interesting. And earlier, uh, Jonathan talked about uh, Mr. <coughs> uh, Horace Barlow. I'm reminded of, of memory when I was a starting out research student in Cambridge and talking in the corridor with Fergus Campbell and telling him what I was going to do my PhD on. And Fergus said, well, the face is very interesting, but you can't do a whole PhD on it. <laughs> <laughs> And back in the 1970s, that's what you would think, because it wasn't really a field there. It wasn't really something that people worked on. Now, 
We know all the different things that faces do. We know how, in a sense, how clever the brain is, as well as how clever faces are to allow us to do these things. And we also know about the considerable specialization of neural systems that read all these different face messages from the face. Very interesting stuff. And although there is a very old model of face processing, which I'll come back to down the bottom right here, there's actually much more up-to-date neurological models, uh, particularly like the framework developed and elaborated by Jim Haxby and co, talking about the, um, the core area to do, uh, that's doing face processing, which is taking by the early perception of facial features, roots it through the superior temporal sources, which are analyzing changeable aspects of faces, these dynamic moment-by-moment -moment kind of uh, things, and root in the lateral fusiform gyrus, carefully not labeled the fusiform face area by Haxby, but labeled the fusiform face area by everybody else, which is deriving invariant aspects of identity um, uh, in that way. So, um, we know a lot about the different brain um, areas and systems engaged in processing these different messages or faces. So, if we talk about the fusiform face area, for example, nice experiment by Tim Andrews and co. in 2002. If you look at this ambiguous figure, faces or bars, when you see it as faces, that's correlated with increased activation in the fusiform face area. <coughs> when you see it bars, there's less activation in the fusiform face area. Another nice experiment, I like the sound of this experiment because what the participants in this experiment by Hassan and Gunn, they actually just lay in the scanner and watched a nice film, which I think is a great thing to do. So they would lay in the scanner and watch the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then the researchers later looked to see when different bits of the brain were particularly active, what were the frames of the film that they were looking at. And what they found was that when the beautiful face areas were particularly active, they were looking at frames like that, which got faces in them, which is kind of reassuring. But when the place areas, a different part of the brain close by, were active, they were looking like frames like that, which were kind of nice geographical scene. So that's a nice kind of experiment where you're not actually doing fancy experimental things with controls, you're just looking to see how there is, if there is a linkage between what's happening in the brain and what's happening uh, out there. Okay, so faces are special. <coughs> They're extraordinarily complicated. We read an enormous diversity of messages from them, and there's all sorts of special areas of the brain involved in different ways in deriving these messages. How do we derive categorical information from faces, the sort of information that tells you whether you're male or female, or you're young, whether you're Vicky Bruce or Colin Blakemore or whatever? Well, that's quite complicated. It relies on more than one type of processing. We're probably using something about the global or holistic shape of the face, something about spatial relationships between parts of the face, and also specific isolated features. Drawn quite nicely by Helmut Lader for me several years ago, um, he just kind of drew out schematically how the visual image of the face is in memory uh, coded in terms of isolated features, relationships between those features, but also some kind of abstract holistic thing that we don't fully understand, but holistic processing is regarded as a very important component of face recognition. And of course, there's a very nice striking illustration of the importance of the relationships between different parts of the face. Um, everybody's seen this. Uh, I was phoned up uh, the day after Margaret Thatcher's death by a journalist who said, and in fact he was right, but I got very suspicious. He said he was writing a special supplement for um, the, the Metro Free newspaper on face perception. And he asked me all these questions about faces, and then he said, ask me about the Thatcher illusion. <laughs> and I thought, I wonder if what he's interested in is really the Thatcher illusion, but actually it was not it was a proper science supplement that he did. But anyway, the Thatcher illusion, which is of course uh, uh, given that name because it happened to be Margaret Thatcher's face that Peter Thompson happened to take scissors to on that particular day in the late 1970s. The story behind that we'll never know, but anyway, it happened to be Thatcher's face. 
And you see that mul upside down Margaret Thatcher looks perfectly normal until you see what it was that actually you were looking at over there. And then you see what's being done to the face. When that image over there is upside down, it looks completely normal. Why does it look completely normal? Well, one story of why it looks completely normal is that when faces are upright, we see all the relationships between the different parts. That's the thing we're really, really good. We process the whole thing. When it's upside down, we actually process things in a kind of piecemeal way. You don't see the relationships be between them. And of course, the important thing is when this is upside down, you've got eyes there screaming, Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, and mouth there screaming, Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher, the bouffant hairstyle that's upside down is screaming Margaret Thatcher, and you haven't got anything that's saying, but hey, these don't, they just don't relate to each other properly. So the parts are telling you it's Thatcher, but you haven't got, according to this interpretation, the thing that glues that together and knows that these things aren't, aren't uh, properly uh, oriented. So, we're all face experts. We're all attuned to faces from the moment of birth, Wonderful faces, they drive things we do. Well, this is where I introduce the great face fallacy. Because this might lead us to think that we should be good at remembering faces. And indeed, people think they are good at remembering faces. They say things like, his face is imprinted on my brain. Well, would you confuse those two men? Sure. Yes. They have a slight type resemblance. If they were wearing hats, yes, you might. Eight different witnesses said Laszlo Virac was the man who committed armed offences in Bristol and or Liverpool. Eight different witnesses. One police officer said his face is imprinted on my brain. George Payen was eventually convicted and Virac was released and pardoned. It's not a one-off. The Innocence Project in the United States has literally hundreds of cases of people who have been convicted on the basis of eyewitness testimony who are later exonerated on the basis of DNA evidence. It is not an isolated case. They don't look identical, these people. If you were married to one of them, you wouldn't rush up and embrace the other one getting off a train. <laughs> there is a slight resemblance but they're not identical. So there's a sort of paradox about face memory. People are actually very good at remembering faces when they're asked to remember pictures of faces in the laboratory. They're very good then. They do extraordinarily well. And people are good at remembering the faces of friends, colleagues, and celebrities. Usually, most people are pretty good at that. Now, there are individual differences there, and there are some people with brain uh, injuries who have prosopagnosia, and some people who are born <coughs> less good at recognising faces, but usually most of us are pretty good at recognising the important others in our world. But people also appear to be bad at remembering faces when they've witnessed crimes. Importantly bad, actually. This really matters. Because we believe that we're good and assert that we know, we get it wrong. So, how do we resolve the paradox? Well, picture memory isn't the same as face memory. We're good at remembering pictures of faces. And resemblance is not the same as identity. And that's the thing that isn't well understood in our legal process. We've got to tailor our investigative and judicial systems to recognize that a witness who picks somebody out of a lineup is saying that person looks like the person I remember. They should not and cannot know that that is the person, except under very circumscribed uh, circumstances. And we've also got to use our understanding of human face perception and memory to enhance the systems we use to try to help the police apprehend the right people, i.e. the people who actually did things. Okay, so picture memory isn't the same as face memory. And here's a little test for some of you, some psychologists in the room. This is something that we said a long time ago, that picture memory and face memory are not the same thing. 27 years ago, indeed, in since Andy Young and myself published a a paper about face memory, and we published it on the basis of a uh, discussion at a conference at Grange over Sands. And here in, in, at this conference, this is the, the, the group photograph taken at the conference, there's lots of very young looking people 27 years ago. And some of you in the audience might be able to recognize in that picture 
you might be able to recognise um, Alan Badley over on the far left, um, a young Ricky Bruce wearing dungarees. They're back in fashion now, I hear, which I'm very excited about. Um, and a number of other people who are will be familiar to some of you here, and, and some of whom are Sabian along with. Um, so it was a long time ago that we were saying, remembering pictures of faces is not the same as remembering faces. A very long time ago. So some of the things that we maybe got right in the theoretical framework, that is a child of its time, with boxes and arrows, but some of the things we maybe got right was we really tried to clarify the different kinds of meaning that are derived from faces and their interrelationships, some of which seem to be born out with the more recent neural uh, pathways analysis since. We pointed out the difference between familiar face recognition and unfamiliar face perception. It's very important. We pointed out the need to understand the task, whether you're asking people to recognize or perceive pictures in laboratories or do things in the world. And we emphasized how much some tasks may be dominated by pictorial coding processes. And that's really important for us to understand because that might begin to explain some of the mistakes that people make when they're looking and trying to remember faces. There have been some very striking findings since then. Uh, Andy Young and colleagues, a small number of years ago now, showed that remembering unfamiliar faces remained sensitive to the precise picture study either, even after many learning trials. You are still sensitive to the actual pictures that you saw. And longer ago, myself and colleagues published what began a series of studies showing that actually you get pictorial properties influencing face matching even when there's absolutely no memory component at all. Matching faces across different image variants is surprisingly difficult. So these are the sorts of tasks that we did. We had a face, that could, as you can see, perfectly high quality video image still of a face and an array of faces at the bottom, and we were asking participants, um, is this person at the top present in the array, and if so, which one, if, which one is he? And um, if you've seen this slide before, you'll know the answer, and if you haven't seen this slide before, some of you will get it right, but one or two of you might find it quite difficult. Um, what do you think? Is he there? And if so, which one is he? Yes. <laughs> Um, he is there and it's number three. But if you look carefully at number three and look at the face above, those two pictures were taken of that young man at the same time, on the same day, one with a video camera and one with a high quality still camera. And I can solve these tasks because I look at bits of hair. <laughs> that's how I know whether they're the same person or not. But that's not actually a very ecologically valid strategy. It's there's quite a lot of differences between those images, and they can be confusing. So I'll give you another one. Is this person present? And if so, which one is he? <laughs> Anybody think he's number two? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's not the there. Baby. The baby. <laughs> he's not there. But the majority of people in our experiment thought he was and thought he was that one, thought he was number two. He's not there. Now the thing is, you know, if you've got a CCTV image of this guy, it won't be as good as this, this quote, and you've got that guy stood in front of you, it's very easy to establish, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that we have incontrovertible evidence that this was the person that did this. Um, I've got data from these experiments, not just observations, but basically across a whole set of arrays that we did, we found people were about 70% correct in these tasks. And interestingly, I didn't do these experiments in order to reveal that you couldn't do it. We were doing these experiments in order to get baseline data when there was no viewpoint change between the face at the top and the ones in the array, in order to see how performance changed as you changed um, viewpoint and expression because we wanted to compare human performance with computer algorithms. So this was supposed to be the baseline 100% condition. And when my 
uh, R8 that time came in and said, well, they're making lots of mistakes, they can't do it. I said, you must be doing something wrong. I mean, I've been working on face recognition for years and years, and they should be 100% correct in this. I, I did not anticipate that they would have the difficulties in this task that they did have. If you change the pose ever so slightly, the target face will make one of them uh, smile, uh, then the hit rate dropped down from 66 to 60%. You know, a lot of errors coming through. So we said, oh, well, they were just uncertain about the task. Let's make the task. He's always there. The person at the top is always there. Tell us which one it is. All you've got to do is to find the person who looks most like the one at the top. And then we got performance as good as 80%. So that's a lot of mistakes. And if you change the angle of the head slightly, it was dropping down. Very far from perfect at matching images of unfamiliar faces. We are confused by spurious resemblance between irrelevant image characteristics. Now, this task is trivially easy if the pictures of the target and the one in the array are the same, or if you use familiar targets. Trivially easy. So that's trivially easy. Is he there? Which one is he? Easy. Trivially easy. Is he there? If so, which one is he? Two. So when you know the faces, easy. Identical pictures, easy. Don't know the people, slight differences in images, not easy at all. And it's nothing really to do with the arrays. I mean, Mike Burton and, and, and his group have done a lot more work on these sorts of tasks, and they've got now tests which are just two, two, two faces at a time. You just have to say if the two people at the top are the same person or not. What do you think? Are those two people at the top the same person or not? Are the two people at the bottom the same person or not? Yes. Well done. Two people at the bottom are the same person, two people at the top are different people. But it would be extremely easy to establish identity between the chap at the top left and the chap at the top right. And indeed, that sort of thing happens in courtrooms quite often using this kind of uh, camera element. We did some kind of more realistic type experiments. We had some fun working with a, a kind of TV documentary where we filmed a, 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 a supposed <coughs> robbery and showed that you get similar sorts of findings with more realistic uh, task. In fact, with poorer images, this is the sort of CCTV camera images that you actually get out when you're filming something happening in a bank. Lots and lots of mistakes. Uh, much more recently, uh, Josh Davis and Tim Valentine have used live targets matching to CCTV, just as you would in a courtroom, and found exactly the same sorts of error rates that we were finding with the, the still images. This is not because it's pictures, it's because they're unfamiliar faces you are not good at extrapolating from one thing to another. So all of that knowledge of faces, all of that 3D schema that you've got, that you come into the world with, isn't allowing you to do very much in terms of dealing with natural transformations in unfamiliar faces. Interesting that, I think. So our expertise with upright faces is very limited. We can't extrapolate from one picture of an otherwise unfamiliar face to another. And they demonstrate that face recognition is much more and actually much harder than matching pictures. Uh, but our facility with familiar faces, interestingly, might be built up, or might, we might think about it being built up from multiple images or multiple pictures. Obviously, when we meet people and we become familiar with them, we're not just seeing pictures of them. We are seeing them in continuous change. But one can imagine, for the sake of argument, that continuous change gives you a number of images. And then the next time you see them, you see them with a slightly different hairstyle and a slightly different age, and you get a number more images. Um, and so on and so forth. <coughs> Mike Burton and Co. Oops, sorry. Mike Burton and, and Co. have shown that you get a very good uh, account of um, face recognition, something that matches human data well, if you assume that your representation of a familiar face is merely the average of the set of images of that person that you've seen. Well, clearly that's bonkers, isn't it? How could you possibly cope 
across all of the lifetime that you might have known an individual, how could it possibly be the case that something could work to recognize Paul McCartney that is just the average of all those different Paul McCartneys? And some of, some of the younger people in the room will not know that this is what Paul McCartney looks like. <laughs> this is what he looks like. This is what he looked like when we were first exposed to him. How could an average, well actually, if you just average all those together, you get something that you recognize very well indeed, despite the fact that this is spanning this entire uh, range of, of transformation. So the idea from um, Burton's group is in a sense, your representation of the familiar face, the one that allows you to transcend all these differences in the Jews, is nothing terribly clever. It is the mere average of everything that you have seen, and that by having that average across all these different instances, you can then cope with any new things that are thrown at you. So the nice idea is, you see, that the, uh, the, the, the face recognition units from Bruce and Young all those years ago, the face recognition units, at least the full face recognition units, so let's not get too hung up over angle views for now, um, are these averages, and, and you'll see that they've all got very peculiarly pointy faces. These are because these images are kind of brought together in order to average them in various ways. But if you ignore that, you'll probably find you can recognize most of the celebrities running along there very nicely. And those are all simple images of a whole bunch of internet images of, of people. So I won't kind of test you by going along the top, but you'll, you'll be able to spot Bill Clinton pretty soon from the top there, and so on and so forth. These are very recognisable images that have simply taken away all that spurious image variation um, for you. Okay, so, this gives me an excuse to talk about what I think is an incredibly interesting observation, not from any of the people with whom I've worked. If you are going to think about averaging, supposing for the sake of argument, averaged images together to build a representation over those images. You have to calibrate your images somehow. You've got to bring them into alignment. You can't be averaging my eyes with my ear next time around. Now we know you look at eyes, and you look at eyes for all sorts of reasons. All sorts of reasons are really important for things other than recognising faces. But it is eyes that are the best represented part of the face as faces become familiar. So as you learn somebody, you become disproportionately sensitive to the eyes and relatively less sensitive to things like hair that change. So one thing that, make, that I'm interested in is that eyes are actually the thing that, on which you essentially calibrate images. Now there's just this brilliant experiment done by uh, Gilad and co, uh, published in PNAS three, four years ago, which was looking at why photographic negatives are so difficult to recognize? This is an interesting question, why photographic negatives are so difficult to recognize, because photographic negatives retain all of the features and the layout from the original. So unless you postulate, as in fact I postulate, that your representations are built on something which actually captures the grayscale in a rather fundamental way, it's not clear why they're so hard to recognize. What um, this group did was show, yeah, they are hard to recognize. So, sorry, my fingers don't move it right there. So they're really difficult to recognize full negatives. Compared with, and we baselined it here, to full positives. But if you just make the eyes positive, just the eyes, your recognition in the contrast chimeras almost as good as the original. And that's not because you can recognize the positive eyes. Because if you put the positive eyes on their own, surrounded by just a grey block, you don't recognize them. Now, I mention this, I mention this study every time I speak anywhere, but I think this points to something about representation of faces, and I don't think it has got as much attention in the literature as it should have. But my wild speculation is, it's because we use the eyes. The eyes is the thing around which we calibrate all the, all the rest. So that's probably wrong. 
but it gives me a very good excuse to, to talk about this finding. And also, if you're a Geordie, you have to say, why eyes? <laughs> but what about witnesses? Well, witnesses might be asked to recognise faces from mugshots or lineups based on an initial encounter which will be dominated by what I'll call initial pictorial qualities, i.e. the circumstances of the image at the time that you saw the crime. Of course, they won't be literally pictures, but they will be dominated by the visual, uh, superficial uh, stuff going on there. Now, the witness may be good at judging resemblance, but probably shouldn't be asked through a lineup to identify that as the person. Now, witnesses aren't just asked to do things in lineups, but you do a lineup when you've got a suspect. Even if you don't put the suspect in the lineup and have a, target, a, a lineup without a suspect, you, you don't call a lineup, you don't do a lineup, or have a video lineup unless you've got some idea of the suspect. But you do interrogate witnesses and try to get knowledge of what the faces look like before you get a suspect. Lots and lots of crimes committed where there are no cameras. I've already warned you about cameras, I hope. Um, crimes in people's homes. So you interrogate a witness to try to get information that might help you to find a suspect with whom you that might then uh, do further investigative work and you might actually uh, convict them on the basis of DNA evidence. But you need to know who you're looking for. So witnesses may be asked to recall faces using used to be sketch artists, now it's composite software. Let's work with a system to produce from your brain a, a picture of the person, and then we can put that picture on Crime Watch, just as you would if you had a CCTV camera and say, does anybody know somebody, you know, does anybody know somebody who looks a bit like this that, that, and can phone in with some information? Well, there have been enormous improvements in composite systems since Jack Penry invented and sold Photofit. Um, very interesting piece of commercialization, actually. Uh, interesting idea. We can um, build faces of criminals by asking people to build images from chopped up features. Uh, this is a good idea. Invent it, presumably patent it, and sell it all the, all the way over the world. Great. It's, not, it's a very bad system, though. You get very bad, very bad likenesses from it. Well, we get better likenesses. I mean, some of you may be able to recognize this person or the person that somebody was building with that. John Major? Yeah. So you can get a recognizable likeness out of an up-to-date photofit type system. This is now an electronic photofit system. eFit, ProFit, there's lots of names for them. They work on the same principle, though. They've got features stored in you know, computer memory and they're pulled out, but they can be smoothed and beautifully moved around and things. So you end up with something which isn't, doesn't have abrupt changes. You can get good likenesses from those systems. That doesn't mean that people can build good likenesses from their memory of faces using that system. That's a very different sort of thing to do. So here's a typical composite that you might get from memory. This is somebody trying to build an image of somebody very famous. Any ideas? Okay, a younger looking Robbie Williams. If he'd done it, he'd have got away with it. Right? So, so this, is, this is somebody building an image from memory of somebody they knew very well. But it's not a good one. It's not recognisable. And in fact, you can get reasonably recognisable things from, from some of the newer composite systems. I'll talk about one of them. You can prob that's a that's a better Robbie Williams. What? You probably recognise him. He's a criminal. He's <laughs> a criminal, isn't he? This one. Yeah. So you can get recognisable likenesses out, but they're rare. And my former colleague, Charlie Fraudenko, actually asked participants to inspect a photograph for a minute, and then two days later construct a composite, which is a little bit like an eyewitness, except they're only looking at a photograph, not at a run of video in this, but... Look at a photograph, two days later, try to build a composite. These were photographs that other people should be able to recognise. So you find the pseudo-witness who doesn't know what any cryptos look like, for example, and you get them to build an image of a crypto because 
for them, it's an unfamiliar face. And then you show the, pick, the composites later to people who like cricket and know the famous cricketers. So you can get people to build composite images, people unfamiliar to them, and then you see how well they're recognized. And these are the percentage rates of correctly naming from the police sketch artist who did quite well in this situation through other sorts of composite systems. Dreadful. Absolutely terrible. So, you know, even though you can produce good artwork, you're not producing things that actually people look at and say, oh yes, that's so and so. So that's a bit of a problem. So why is composite performance so low when the systems can now produce good artwork? Well, there's two issues here. Firstly, the process of analysing memory to retrieve individual face features is unnatural and difficult. That is not the way that we remember faces in the brain. So asking people to do that in reverse and go back to features can't be done. Secondly, and more subtly, eyewitnesses are unfamiliar with faces, by definition. If they knew it was Fred next door that did this to them, then they'd say it was Fred next door. They're unfamiliar with faces, so they remember the external features best. Unfamiliar face memory is disproportionately weighted towards the external features. That's where the most information is in a simple pattern. But familiar people need to see the internal features, because it's the internal features that they will use to recognise that person when it's shown on Crime Watch. So there's a mismatch between what the unfamiliar uh, witness may be able to depict and what you want for a good composite. Um, and we showed um, a couple of years ago now that if you look at how well you can sort composite images against targets, so which one was the person trying to produce a composite of, it's a better way of doing getting measurable performance than using naming rates. If naming rates are down at 1 or 2 or 3%, you can't really do experiments on it. So we always use sorting tasks so that you can actually do experiments on, on performance. So look at what happens if you've got a whole composite, just the internal features or just the external features. What you find is that the external features alone are nearly as good as the whole composite. The internal features, which are the things that you would want to be good, are not very well um, produced at all. So that's one of the real problems with, with composites. So I'm just going to conclude by talking a little bit about a new kind of composite system. But instead of asking people to use an unnatural way of remembering faces, getting inside their brains and extracting feature by feature, exploits what you're better at, which is judging resemblance. And this is the um, EvoFit system, which was developed by uh, Charlie Froud and, and, and Peter Hancock. <coughs> Then both at Stirling when we started, Charlie's now at uh, University of Central, Central Lancashire. And what the EvoVote Fit system is, it, it doesn't ask people to recall individual features. Though there is a little bit about that for the hairstyle to begin with, which I won't go into now. It asks people to look at a screen of faces and pick the faces that look closest to your memory of the person you saw. You pick the ones that look closest, and then, cleverly, the system uses genetic algorithms to evolve another screen of faces which should have got closer to your memory, and then you pick some more and then it evolves it again and so on and so forth. What's also clever about this system is that none of these are real faces. These are all synthetic faces built from principal components derived from sets of real faces, so no individual is actually framed by showing actual mug shots. So these are all synthetic faces and the witnesses working the screens of synthetic faces to come towards something that may resemble their memory better than where they started from. And this at the time this was done, uh, Michael Owen has actually grown into his composite a little bit. But anyway, this was successive generations of Michael Owen, the footballer, and this was what that particular person decided was good enough. Uh, so you can get to points where people say, yeah, that, that's what that's good enough, that's like my memory. And in fact, this has been used successfully in a number of cases. It was first used in a, in a criminal investigation when they'd drawn a complete blank for the victim of a particularly nasty sexual assault had uh, in, originally done some sort of composite and then the trails had gone cold, nothing had happened. And they asked Charlie to come in and, and work on a composite using EvoFit 
when this was the composite that was produced of the Beast of Bosia, the hair's all been added in because that was the hairstyle that the witness remembered. You can't actually do their hairstyles like that with principal components analysis. But it, the image really, really upset the victim once she'd made it. She really didn't like it. So anyway, eventually, this was the guy that was convicted. And although you might say, well, he doesn't look terribly like that composite, remember you're dominated by external features because these are unfamiliar faces to you. If you conceal the hair, it's, it's, it's not bad. And there's been a number of other cases. If you wanted, you can have a look on the EvoFit website. There were a number of uh, solved cases with the EvoFits that were produced and the, and the person who was eventually convicted. So this looks promising. Um, because the hair is so important in our impressions of unfamiliar faces, and because witnesses are working to build an image of an unfamiliar face, one of the things that's now done in EvoFit is to actually blur out all of the hair while the witnesses work on trying to come up with a better representation of the internal features. And blurring the hair, come up with a sort of hair to get set a frame, then blur it out and get the witnesses to work with the internal features. Uh, a couple of different papers now have shown that that produces composites which are considerably uh, more effective. So the final thing I wanted to say, and I did mention the fact that there are individual differences in face recognition across population. We all are fairly good at familiar face recognition, but some people are better than others. When it comes to the unfamiliar face uh, matching, those array tasks, you get big individual differences. And when it comes to things like building composites, some people produce composites that look quite good, and some people produce composites that really look very bad. One recent project that I just thought I'd end on, actually I've had a couple of different students do this in, in different variants, compared how well people could produce an EvoFit likeness, that's using that EvoFit composite system, students, participants, who self-rated as being arty, compared with students who self-rated as not being arty. I'm sure arty is a terrible word to use in this company, but that's the word we use. And you self-rate on a simple little questionnaire, you know, uh, were you interested in drawing at school? Did anybody ever describe you as artistic? Would you spend time looking at pictures? You know, it was a sort of simple questionnaire. And you have people who rate themselves as high on that or low on that. And these groups were not differentially good or bad at face recognition. There was no difference in their face recognition abilities. Um, but there was, in terms of the average rated of likeness, how good the composites were using EvoFit, the high artistic ability students produced considerably better composites than the low artistic ability students. And we've done this since with a slightly more um, ecologically valid thing where you're studying a video and then trying to build composites. So <coughs> working with a system based on resemblance and coming up with something that matches your memory of that person seems to be something which uh, where there's a variation which might go with interesting other things to do with your um, skills in the visual arts. Okay, so conclusions. Even this so-called expert face recognition is, is pretty limited in what it can do. Remembering and matching unfamiliar faces is dominated by what I would call pictorial properties. It is not just about pictures, because you get these confusions even if you've seen a live um, unfamiliar face, but we call them pictorial properties. Our facility with familiar faces may arise actually because of the averaging together of lots and lots and lots of fairly low-level image representations from the run of images that you've ever seen of that person, rather than from a more elaborate 3D-based abstract description of features. We are dominated by resemblance when we look at faces, but we live in a, in a context where the judicial system, and lots of other systems, um, security systems, demand identity rather than resemblance, and that creates a bit of a, 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 a tension. But finally, I've just pointed out that newer systems to help witnesses recall faces, like EvoFit, can use impressions of resemblance to create opposite identities. Now, if you're really interested in this, there's a fairly recent new book by myself and Andy Young. This is probably the last thing that Andy Young and I will write together. But also, I just wanted to acknowledge lots and lots of other people 
who have contributed to the work that um, I've been talking about rather than doing uh, over the years. <laughs>